Thank you. Very welcome to this afternoon. Um, I hope you had good lunch and uh, I have the ungrateful task to wake you up. So we have an interesting topic, which is triggers. We're going to have a short introduction what triggers are, how can they be used and whatever. Some special words about security, which usually tend to be one of those parts of computer science that is left for the last or behind or forgotten. How you manage triggers and some use cases and pitfalls that you can have. Okay, um, in the use cases, we are going to look at one specific one which happened in real life in our company. And it was the reason why I decided to make this presentation, just to warn people what they, to take care of what they do with triggers. Uh, I work for the uh, ETH Zurich. It is a high school, a university, in the Institute for Economics Research. And what I do there is databases. Uh, in particular, moving everything away from Oracle. That's what we are doing. And there are a few other or, uh, MySQL and MSSQL servers. Some of them we are going to skip to, but uh, some will not be possible because of company policies and yeah, whatever. Um, I also work for the Swiss PostgreSQL Users Group. I co-founded that with some colleagues a few years ago. And we organize also a PG Day in Switzerland, which is going to be this year, end of June. On the 29th of June, you are obviously invited to attend. Currently, the call for speaker is open. OK, what is a trigger? And basically, it is a, some code, a piece of functionality, which is executed each time that an event happens. In this terms, an event is, can be an update, an insert, a delete, or even a truncate. So uh, how, is there anybody in the, in the audience that already has used triggers? Everyone, yes. I would say so, everyone, because actually, Every time that you create a constraint, we, heard, we have heard this morning something about constraints, how nice they are. What you create implicitly is a, is a trigger, a system trigger, which is executed each time that you try to do something. Okay, uh, what we are talking about here are, are those triggers that you create explicitly. So you write the code for them. You want something to happen when some events happen. You can write triggers on tables, foreign tables, and views. We're going to focus in particular about tables, which is the most common use case. Okay, the basic workflow. Um, each time that you do something, for instance, you insert a row or change a row or delete a row or whatever, or some columns are changed or some other characteristics are met, we're going to go into the details afterwards. Then you have to execute a function. You ask Postgres, each time that that happens, execute that function. And then you do whatever you need to do. And then you have to inform Postgres what to do with that data that was to be changed, inserted or deleted. So now, in order to have a trigger, you must have a trigger definition, which you're going to see later. And what we're going to see first is uh, so-called uh, trigger functions. This is where you code exactly what has to happen at that moment when something changes in your database. Uh, this is quite powerful if you think of that because you can write functions about almost everything. You can do whatever, lots of things. And every time that something is powerful, it becomes dangerous. Okay, what are the characteristics of such a function? Basically, I have... Um, I have a pointer here, but I'm quite old-fashioned. It must return trigger, right? This is how you define a, a trigger function. After that, you don't have parameters. And the rest is the body of your function. We are going to see what happens inside that function, which is the most important thing you need to know in order to implement any triggers. In particular, we have two special variables, new and old which are quite handy because uh, they give you access to the information that's going to be changed. It's, uh, it would be changed if you don't decide inside the function not to change it or whatever. 
The very interesting thing, you can write trigger functions practically in every programming language which is supported by, um, by Postgres. Maybe there are some exceptions, but, uh, well, usually you can do that. Now, uh, the examples that I'm going to show you here, you're going to see a lot of code, are all examples that are based in uh, PG, P, uh, PL, PG, SQL. But of course, you can use uh, PL Python or whatever. Okay, when you are inside that function, you have some specific um, information that you don't, you wouldn't have access to without being inside a trigger function. New and old, we have seen already. New specifies the data that is going to be inserted or the old data in an update. So that means you are not going to have a new and old for each kind of trigger. Well, for each kind of operation in a trigger. Yes? It's obviously when you are inserting something, you have a new, something new. But uh, if you are deleting something, you don't have anything new. You, you only have an old, which you want to get rid of. In an update, you have both. Then you have uh, TGOP, which is the operation which is being uh, executed. You can use that if you want to make uh, um, a case statement, for instance, okay, in case of an insert, do that and that, in case of an update, do that and that, and delete, do that and that. Just don't forget, if you're doing that, that uh, in that block of the insert or update, you are not going to have every time both new and old. You have to be aware what you are doing. Then we have a trigger name, trigger table name, and table schema, which are quite straightforward. A trigger has a name, it's acting on a table, which is in a schema. Okay, now, let's say we have created a function. Now we have to inform Postgres, okay, each time that anything happens, that is what we do here. You give the trigger a name, then you say, okay, when should it happen? Before anything happens or afterwards? This makes a difference because um, in an uh, after trigger, you are going to have the data already changed in the database, right? You still have the more possibility inside the trigger to roll back, or not to roll back, but uh, let's say to make some changes to make it different. But it's better to think beforehand if you are going to use a before or an after trigger. The event is insert, update, delete, or truncate. On which table you are going to uh, execute the function. And then you have two possibilities. You can uh, use for each row or for each statement. The difference is for each row, you are going to call this function for each row that changes. That means if you make an update which updates, let's say, 100 rows, you're going to call this function 100 times. Think of that in terms of performance. That can be or can become a problem. When you make a for each statement trigger, then it's executed only once for each statement. That can be useful in some cases. We are going to see at, uh, at an example. This is the most basic flow that you can set up for a trigger. There are some additional possibilities. We're not going to go into too much into details. You can create a trigger as a constraint trigger, so you can uh, handle it uh, or manage it uh, using the usual uh, possibilities that, that uh, constraints have. So you can defer it. We have heard in the morning you can defer um, checks con or, or constraints until the end of a transaction. That can be quite helpful sometimes. You may want to use that for that reason. And you use instead of, apart from before or after, instead of, if you want to create a trigger which acts on a view, right? The rest is actually the same. Okay. In uh, starting with Postgres 10, there is something new relating to trigger, there are transition tables. Uh, in before, before Postgres 10, it was possible to read what happened in a single row if you had a for each row statement, right? Now, uh, if you had a for each statement, it was not possible, you didn't have any information about that. Now it is possible to get this information unblocked, basically as a, in form of two tables. You see here how you can use it, new tab, old tab. The name is, can be whatever, because you define that in the creation of the trigger, as we are going to see. And this here is just an example that gives out some information, some summary information about all the rows that have been updated. 
So, you define the tables that you're going to use into the function using referencing new table or old table. You don't always have to have both. You can use just one if you just need one. It depends on what you are implementing exactly. And we can see here an example. This one here, the first four are called for each row. They give some information about that specific row. And here we have a summary of all changes, which is done with, a, with, um, with an after trigger for each statement. So, any questions so far? Okay. Now, an interesting topic, trigger security. Okay. Uh, there is a privilege that you can give on a table, which is called trigger. This allows the person, the user, that has this privilege to create triggers. Um, you probably have already seen uh, the youngest uh, database uh, administrators beginning, starting their careers, uh, a grant all two, grant all on, grant all two, etc., etc. You are going to grant also trigger privilege. So you are granting actually somebody the right to create a function that will act on that on that table and changes on that table. Let's assume it's a table that records bank accounts, and you say, okay, for each transaction which is done, move one cent on my account. This runs completely transparently. You're not going to see it. You can look for it, but it's not so easy. So please think very good when you grant that privilege what you are doing. Using a trigger is a different story. Uh, in order to execute a function, usually you need to have execute privilege on the function. This is not necessary on, uh, on trigger functions. If somebody has a right to insert, update, or delete, or whatever on a table, basically he has implicitly the right also to execute a trigger function on it. But there is a, some, one thing that you have to consider. There are additional restrictions which apply. For instance, if, uh, if you call in the body of a function, if you do something in the body of a function that is going to change another table on which that particular user has no rights, no privileges, then that's not going to be allowed. Here's an example. We have a generic user that can make select, insert, update, delete on that, on that table public books, which has a trigger. And um, and that trigger, within that trigger, what we do is write information in a log table. Hmm? The text that you have seen before is also written at the same time in a log table. Now you need, obviously, insert rights for that, uh, insert privilege for that table. If you don't have it, that generic, generic user doesn't have it. So what happens? You get an error. The good thing is, well, you have many ways how to you solve this problem. First of all, you see quite exactly what happened where. So it's not a mystery. The error message is very clear. And then what you can do? Well, one way would be to grant insert privilege to the user on that log table. That would be one possibility. It depends on what you really want to do. <coughs> and another possibility is declare the function as security definer. If you do that, you also have to be careful because uh, Defining a function as a security defined function means basically that every user that has execute right and every user which has some privileges on a table having a trigger has implicitly the rights to execute it. So that means basically you are going to give um, lots of, um, lots of um, possibilities to any user that is, that is using the table. Usually, the good thing is when you create a trigger, you, just, you don't do it just because you have some specific purpose in mind, and you actually want that every user that is doing that update or insert or delete is going to doing something else in the database. So which way you choose depends completely on, on your design, on your, on your um, principles, right? Okay, when it goes to managing triggers, well, there is not very much that you can do. This is uh, alt trigger. You can well, you can rename it. You can tell it depends on an extension, so that uh, during upgrades and everything, uh, it is going to be considered. 
you can drop it. So if you want to change, for instance, uh, if it's a before or an after trigger, this kind of stuff, you can do it. What you must do is drop it and recreate it, right? But the main message is real changes to trigger behavior is not that, right? The real changes in trigger behavior are done within the function body. Okay, you can disable trigger with an alter table command. This is quite useful in some occasions. Let's say you have a trigger that forbids you to do something. The good thing on triggers, by the way, is that uh, it doesn't look, if you are a super user and there's a trigger, you're not going to be allowed to do some specific things. It doesn't, it doesn't help to be a super user, that's what I want. If you have a trigger that, let's say, um, throws an exception, this exception is going to be thrown even if the, if the super user theoretically had the right to do some specific operation. So it's a good protection. Okay, you can disable triggers and you can re-enable them. You need, uh, usually you, you give them a name and you say which, which trigger you are going to change. It's also possible to make um, disable all triggers. Um, if you do it as a non-super user, what are going to, what's going to happen is that you might get an error that you don't have permissions on some triggers, which are system triggers. If you create an index, a constraint, or whatever, you create an index, uh, you create a trigger. Voila. So this is uh, that much that you can do with uh, managing triggers. More, more interesting or more important even, okay, let's say you come into a company, they have a PostgreSQL database and they want, to have, want you to understand what the, the, the database is doing. You usually look at the schema, you look at the tables, you have a list of functions or whatever, but you need to figure out somehow are there any active components like triggers in place. It's important to know that because things happen transparently, you don't know, uh, um, a developer says, okay, I'm trying all the time to do that and that, and it, the database always does that and that and that, why is that? But that might be a trigger behind. So, how do you inspect this information? One possibility is using the catalog table PG class, which is um, where all information about all tables in the database are, are stored. And it has um, a field called rel has triggers, a Boolean. And that's, well, that's helpful. You can say, okay, it has some triggers. But it's pretty much everything you get from that. So you don't know any, anything more. It has triggers, okay, that means you may start with that table and look for, okay, well, which triggers are on that table. More helpful, information schema triggers, there you get information which table has which triggers, right? Okay, so now you already know something more. Okay, the trigger name, as we have seen, you get it here. You, you also get the action statement in the same view, in the same information schema view. This is good because the name doesn't have nothing to do directly with a function behind. So you can use the same name for two triggers having different actions behind. Right? That, ca that can be quite confusing if you say price change and you assume, okay, this is going to be when the price changes, and actually what happens here is a completely different function which is called. That can be very confusing. Okay. Um, when you write a trigger, well, you have a function and you have a trigger. You can use the same function for different triggers. Right? We have seen that already. You can give them the same name, that would be helpful or different name, maybe you want to add the table name or whatever to that uh, trigger name in order to be more transparent at what, what is happening. Okay, but you, more important is to find out which, which triggers are using which function, or to, or to put it in other words, if you want to make any change in a function which is a trigger, you are going to change possibly mm, the behavior for a lot of tables. If you know what you're doing, maybe it's not a problem. If it's a database you don't know so much and you have to explore it, 
Maybe you would like to find out first. Well, let me see, have a look what that trigger actually is doing, by the way, or, or which, which triggers use this function. Oh. That's the way you can do it. You don't need to read that. Uh, you, you are going to get the slides anyway. You can check it out with, in your database. It's very handy. You find out, OK, having a, a unique identifier for the function, OK, look for all the triggers that use that function. And so you get a list that tells you, uh-huh. Now we have two tables with two triggers, which use the same function. Based solely, based only on the name of the trigger, you would have maybe not found out that this is the case, right? Good. The next step is, uh, well, okay, you can find also which triggers has a table using the, I call it the best PostgreSQL client, PSQL. Um, you just make backslash D and you get the whole information down here. You really have everything. When is going to happen what, on, on which, uh, on which um, event, and what is going to be done. You may even have conditions. It's possible to uh, define a trigger in such a way that it only fires if certain conditions apply. In this case, this will only fire if either the price changes or the currency. This is maybe in a situation where you want to have a, a report just for those specific cases. You don't always need to, to, to record everything that changes. In a node it, you may want to, but uh, in some cases, maybe it's enough. It depends, as usual, on your concrete use case. Um, there are uh, some interesting functions which can be used in PostgreSQL to retrieve information. If you try to find out how a function looks like, in order to understand what it's doing, uh, you have this pg get function def, which is very helpful. What you get is actually a statement which you could use to recreate a function. So you can inspect exactly the whole functionality, what it is doing, what happens when, etc., etc. Um, this is, I would say, one of those functions that everybody that works with triggers should know. Because that's the way how you, of course, if you have pitch admin or some fancy, um, let's say, um, uh, graphical user interfaces, you might have it already served. But what they do behind is exactly that. Good. Uh, any questions so far? Does not seem to be the case. Now, it, that was the, um, let's say, the, the more dry part about technicalities, how it works, how, it's, how you put it up, how you set it up, et cetera, et cetera. Now it becomes a bit more um, lively with some life. You want to make or create triggers for something. Okay, um, typical use cases. Keep track of changes, history or audit. Uh, in another presentation, I used to, um, specify a bit more about that. History and audit uh, is not exactly the same. You need an audit when you want to record every change because you have, let's say, some problem. Or you might have, you might have legal uh, constraints or obligations to keep that information. A history is most, that you want to record changes that are important for your business case. For, for example, uh, we have, where I work, uh, a history table which records the number of employees of a company that receives a questionnaire, they respond. This may change over time, and that's, that may change within a, s a single month, maybe two or three times because there are corrections, information was not uh, arrived too late or whatever. So of those two to three changes, the only important one is the last one which is going to be used during the calculations done with the answers of that company. So we just need this information once in a month. There's no need to keep store, to keep track of everything that changed in between. Difference between history and audit. You can make uh, complex checks before modifications in the database. This is also a typical use case. Sometimes it's not so easy to make a check and that's it. Or what happens often is you make a check and at the end you write a function 
in order to com comply with that check. What you can do also is obviously create or modify additional entries which are related to that entry. Let's say um, an example, of, I think it's in the documentation or something like this. You create a, a new worker, a new, a new employee, and then you need to create at the same time entries in the in tables which record, let's say, loans or, or um, wages and insurances and whatever. This is one thing that you can do. One very interesting use case is protect data. This is exactly the use case I was telling you before, the one we're going to look a bit more in detail. Uh, it was a bit, um, how would I say, um, in the US would it probably be prohibited by now, but it would say it was a pain in the ass. Okay, what can happen? What are the problems that can happen with triggers? A very important thing to consider is in which order triggers are executed. Now, first of all, you can have, for one single table, many triggers. There is no real restrictions how many you can write for that. But uh, let's put it simple. Uh, if you have more than two or three, then there is some problem somewhere. Usually, you don't need more than that. And if you do, take very much care how they are ordered. And now, the, how to find it out, it's quite easy because uh, First of all, you have the timing. If it's after, uh, before or after, this gives a clear timeline. Okay, those are executed before, that, those after. And then, within that category of before and after, triggers are ordered alphabetically by name. Right? So if you write that, let's say you have three triggers, all before triggers, and they all change something in the data, the subsequent trigger is going to receive the data of the previous trigger, already changed, right? So that means um, you might start making um, or some reporting or whatever a bit, a bit wrong because you use an information which is not current anymore or it is not the one that is going to be written at the end in the database. So the one simple way to find out is using again information schema triggers, you just order action timing and trigger. This is just uh, because uh, the letter B comes after A. So after you would like to have before, before, after in the, in the, in the, in the list. Another pitfall, um, here we have, we create a table which is supposed to be a history. We just tracked some changes. This is just an example. Then we create a trigger on the, on the public books table, which writes in that history table, right? Insert into blah, blah, voila. So far, so good. Nothing happened yet. And now I can make my updates, everything works right. And now I say, alter column, last modify time, type timestamp. It used to be timestamp TZ with time zone, and now it changed to timestamp, okay? The base table, not the history table. Now I said basically already, we forgot actually to correct this data type in the history table. And what happens if you call the, if you make an update now, it is that the information is going to, the boss is going to tell you a moment, I receive a timestamp and I'm supposed to receive a timestamp with time zone. Something is not okay. Again, the good thing is that you can find out very good and very simply where all the problem happened. It's just a general recommendation. When you get, um, um, <clears throat> when you get um, an error message from Postgres, read it carefully because usually you, it contains enough information. I've seen many times, ah, I, don't, I can't write in that table, I can't read that table and whatever, and the problem was not that, but the, 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 the permissions on the schema were not given. So. Uh, Okay, this is the, this very fine use case that I was talking about before. It's triggers are an efficient way to make things. Okay, I said before we have uh, survey data from companies. It's about 10,000 companies every month uh, that are used. This information is used in order to calculate uh, indicators, economic indicators, which are given then to the public. The, um, 
government um, or the newspapers or whatever, whoever wants them. But, um, uh, well, okay, and we have, we have a, a table which contains the data. Now, at the beginning it was so, we have data in this table only if somebody answered the questionnaire. So, that was okay for a while until somebody said, wait, but uh, can we make a detailed non-response analysis? So I said, okay, that will be a bit difficult because we don't know. We can estimate who was, who received a questionnaire, but we don't know actually. We started making a summary tables, including uh, all the numbers of uh, uh, identification numbers of participants and that all. Blah, blah. That worked not bad, but it was terrible in performance when it came to summarizing the information in view for, for, the, for the web, for instance. So we changed completely the idea. What we do now is, okay, every time that we start a survey, we make a set of entry. They just don't have, there is a field named data, which, is, which are the answers of the questionnaires. So we leave them empty. So we know exactly who we wrote to and a lot of other information too, which can be used for very detailed analysis. Okay. But that means uh, we had to make some additional changes. One of those were the survey data which comes from paper questionnaires does not go directly in the database. It must be scanned, it must be verified, and it lands in a, in a, in a middle table, let's say, and from there it is transformed using a trigger and inserted in the end in the target database, in the, tar in the target table, pardon. So far, so good. Now, that's what we did. Create empty entries, and then we need to change some information in our trigger. Okay, here is an example how it looks like. This is a very simplified uh, version for this example. We have a bit more than two fields in, in our questionnaires. But anyway, you have uh, an identification number, year, month, when it's done. Uh, a run of analysis, that means it has been analyzed. It has been used for calculating uh, values that are published today and the values themselves, right? It might look like this. Now, okay, we have some data in it. We can compute some statistics, okay, average of both values how many forms we have for year and month, right? Okay, now uh, we in introduced those new empty questionnaires. And now if you do it now again, what we see, before changing it, we had obviously as many questionnaires at all, as many as question with answers. After that change we have Lots more because we have all those that were not answers too. So far, so good. This remains the same, which is correct. Okay, then we had to change the trigger. In the old system, we only needed to insert data, never to update, because um, data comes in, it's there, and it doesn't change. In the new system, since we created empty records, we have to update them, right? So, we change from insert to update. So far, so good. Now something weird happened, okay. New paper came in, new uh, questionnaires came in, in paper. They were scanned, verified, et cetera, et cetera. The trigger fired and it began writing data in the database. And we had, after that first um, time where we used the new system, different values in the averages, okay? That means the data changed and that is not allowed. It's quite bad if data from many years ago is changed suddenly. So the problem was, what was the problem, yeah? Okay, obviously we restored all the data. And what we added is an additional trigger, which is a, what I call a data protection trigger. It basically says everything that is behind a certain time is not a, cannot be changed must not be changed. Nobody is allowed to change anything before, uh, if it's not in this month of this year, right? Okay, 
we, we implemented that, created that, and a good thing, okay. Now, we, uh, we, received, we, we inserted again the paper data to see what happened. And what we have seen, error, exactly this data protection trigger says, okay, it's not allowed. But what am I trying to do? What I see here, I'm trying to make some changes in 2017-9, which is consistent with the observation we had, as the average is changed, right? Okay, then we grouped, okay, uh, what does that happen? It happens in these other triggers, which adds exactly these paper forms. And we see here, we forgot to put some additional conditions. So in, when data from January uh, 2018 came in, it was trying to update records of any, as of every record of, of a specific user having a, this SPID, right? That was the problem. So we had now a trigger which helped us to find out the trigger problem, solve it. That was good. And everything went right. Any questions so far? So we are nearing the end. Uh, triggers and other stories is a short chapter. Basically, what I want to show you is the if you, if you start reading about triggers in the internet, you're going to see um, some people uh, say they are absolutely absurd. You should never use them. It's the worst thing you can do for many reasons. And they start enumerating many. Actually, my experience was at the end, it's not a trigger, the problem, but the function. So it's, it might have programming errors or bad programming. We have seen in the morning how performance can change with some changes using indexes or whatever. Um, and one point about audit data, so I, I read, okay, you should never do that. You have legal requirements that you have to have this information, but you are putting that information in the same database. So it's almost like uh, if uh, a manager is, ma is, uh, is uh, checking his own work instead of having a committee checking his work. So, well, my answer to that is foreign data wrappers. I assume that uh, most of you, if not used, at least have heard of it. It's just a very handy way to exchange data with other databases uh, from, a, from a PostgreSQL database. If you use the PostgreSQL uh, foreign data wrapper, it's almost transparent how it works. Here's just an example of how it would work. You create the extension, you create the foreign table uh, with some information how to connect, and then uh, the, we change the trigger, it doesn't write locally, it, it writes in the remote database, right? And this is exactly what happens afterwards. So now you have your database and your audits in two completely different instances, uh, in two different databases. You could do it naturally in different clusters and everything, so or in different machines, or whatever, which, which would comply with basically every possible legal requirement in that sense. So, <clears throat> some recommendations. Using triggers, we have seen that it's very easy. You can write a function in a, in a few minutes. You can uh, you can create a trigger in even less time, and put it in, in whatever system that you have. But exactly that's the problem. Everything that is easy and has a lot of power generates dangers. So. Okay, it is true, triggers are a powerful mechanism for automating processes in a database. Might be helpful. If you have an application interface made of functions, it's possible. Some design principles work on that. It's, it's also sharding friendly. It has some, some, some advantages. Then you don't need to use triggers. You already have functions. If, you, if nobody's going to write directly into a table or make an update in a table, but it's going to call let's say a web interface is going to call only a set of functions in order to make any changes in the databases, then you usually don't need triggers. You need them if you have to do some very special things, like, uh, yes, in our case, for instance, when you have to transmit data or, or modify data entering from a source into another format to put in another table, or protecting things. Very important is to make extensive tests, yes. Uh, 
The problems we had, as I explained before, was one of those typical problems. Uh, we want it, and we want it now. Testing, we did test, but uh, with a subset of data, and it didn't show up any problems. Therefore, also my other recommendation, when you make tests, make them using real data. You're not going to have answers, uh, real answers, if you're going to use only a small subset uh, of fake data or test data. Okay. And obviously, uh, I shouldn't say that, everybody knows that. Make a backup of your data before launching a trigger into Russia. You do a backup anyway before you change anything that might be dangerous. Okay, and then uh, the order, as I said before. Look at that. Think exactly what the function is doing. Is it doing what I want to do? If you generate errors messages, make them clear what's happening, so that people know, ah, okay. It's very, uh, the most stable thing is if somebody comes to you and say, okay, look, um, we have a problem. Uh -huh, what a problem. Yeah, do we have an error message? Mm, yeah, it says um, something occurred. This is a little bit Microsoft world, right? Uh, and last but not least, document your triggers. Uh, I don't know if everybody knows about this comment uh, functionality within PostgreSQL. It's very handy. You can document your, all your objects in the database directly in the database. And what we do, actually, we extract that information from our documentation wiki. Uh, and display it in a, in a wiki page. So we say let's comment on trigger, blah, 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 name of the trigger on database, blah, 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 and you say what it does or what it's supposed to do. So you can always um, have um, at the same time a complete information from, uh, from, for people that are not directly, don't look directly in the database, documenting, and you also have all the rest of possibilities as soon as you start uh, investigating them. Okay, uh, you are going to find these slides on this link, but I think that uh, we are going to put them also on, uh, on the wiki or somewhere where you're going to get access. Here, uh, some, uh, where you can find more information about that. The best information, obviously, is the documentation of Postgres, one of the really impressively good documented software. And of course, uh, you can Google a bit and you're going to find mountains, terabytes of information of people saying why triggers are good or why triggers are bad. What I wanted to do here basically is give you an idea what it can do, but the main message again is be careful because they are good, they can do very helpful things, but they can be dangerous. My coordinates, if you want to contact me for information, I'm going to be here the rest of the day anyway. And, of course, if you have questions, I don't know if there is going to be a feedback on that form, but uh, uh, maybe in Oslo it was like this, so I assume it's similar. If not, we are going to be informed how to do it. And, of course, questions. Thank you. Uh, if, I, uh, if I do a query on a table that has triggers, mm -hmm. Uh, well, if if you have to to execute a trigger, uh, it takes time. Uh, and uh, if I do an explain on that same query, mm -hmm. uh, uh, no, uh, they're not going to see it. Yeah, triggers you have to investigate in a different way. You're not going to see it in the in the explain because you are you are investigating what happens in one single table, and this is a, let's say some way of uh, going a bit outside of that operation and doing something. For that reason, it's important to think about the performance. Okay, then how can I uh, uh, get a good uh, uh, idea of uh, uh, of if there are any performance problems in trigger functions? Within the trigger, you have uh, usually statements, SQL statements that are performed. Maybe that is also some additional procedural uh, code, but all those statements within the trigger, you can test, we can explain also for themselves. So you can use them in order to find out or get an, uh, then you know also, okay, if you, if you make uh, for each row, as I said before, if, if you update two, 200, then you're going to have 200 calls and you multiply that by the, the performance of this single statement and then you get an idea. 
It's a bit more complicated than just make and explain directly. Thank you. Uh, about your sample uh, regarding the audit database, uh, is there any way uh, to know that uh, an external trigger is uh, actually affecti uh, affecting the, any table in my, my database? I uh, understand you right. You mean you have an audit uh, database and you want to know if somebody external is doing something. Exactly. Mm -hmm. uh, the short answer is no. <laughs> the, with the longer answer is uh, you have to um, uh, you have to do the, you have to uh, tackle the problem differently. Okay. If things are changing in the in the in the audit database, I mean, usually you, what you have there are just inserts. For instance, you could start um, uh, forbidding anything else in inserts. It's one good way to start. And then uh, the rest you have to monitor because uh, it is really completely transparent. But of course, those who are writing there have received also the permission to do that. So um, if you get an insight, you, if, you, if you've seen your log, in your log tables or you make, let's say, whatever kind of uh, additional audits and you see that some inserts are happening uh, from you don't see the source, you just see an insert happened. So um, you have to look for it in a, in a different way. Um, honestly, I'm a bit uh, unsure how you would do it the best. But I think the, most, the best protection you could have in an audit is exactly that, to avoid anything else in inserts. And then uh, usually you know who is supposed to write in the database. When you, when you, when you write a foreign data wrapper, for writing in, a, in an audit table, in a foreign audit table, you have also to give exactly a specific user and its password in order to connect and make the changes in the, in the foreign table. So that means this user must be known. And what we do, for instance, if uh, we do something in this way, those users always are characterized with an FTW at the beginning that we know, aha, uh -huh, it's a user that is not used directly in the database, but it's used from outside. It's, a, it's more a design question than you don't have a, a recipe that you can use directly without uh, any more work, I'm, I'm afraid. How, how do you test? We, we use as developers, we have like testing frameworks for applications we build, for functions we build with mm -hmm. triggers and I guess in general with functions inside the DB. Mm -hmm. How do you set about testing them? Yeah, um, well, you can do it in a systematic way, or depending on, on, on how, how many, how, how often it, it occurs that you write functions in the database, right? In the case of triggers, you always do it. Well, what you do usually is just you have an initial state, you run the trigger in, the, in, in a set of scenarios. So, and so many inserts, and so many updates, and so many deletes, and then you check if the output is correct. Mm, very much, the, I don't know of any tools, there are probably, but I don't know them, how you could, that you could do it, use in order to um, make those tests more, uh, more structured. Yeah, but I'm quite sure there are, but uh, I don't know them. And by the way, actually testing database functions in general, I think is a topic that uh, deserves a complete a complete, uh, a complete talk. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank okay. you.